When you're feeling all alone Only you to hold your own No one there to help you Only there to hold you down So stop Don't beat up yourself Cause it's everyone else So don't look down Look up around Cause you are better What causes someone to abuse alcohol or drugs? Often, it's a need to escape reality, to mask feelings and to avoid fear or pain. Those who fall into addiction need the help and support of a community to recover. But what happens if the community you live in is suffering as well? See, Lindsay grew up in an indigenous family who struggled with depression, violence, and substance abuse as a result of intergenerational traumas. Outside of her community, she faced discrimination and couldn't find support at home as a result of family issues. Feeling trapped, she turned to alcohol and drugs, desperate for an escape. Eventually, her substance abuse became so extreme that she was putting both her positive relationships and life at risk. It's unbelievable what these kids will do to impress. Spend hours on their image without even collecting a check. One thing that I know for sure is that in this life, we live many lives. And I've learned that in the age that I am now, I've, I feel like I've lived so many different lives. What if the trees built up resistance and just stop growing? Are the rivers formed a front line and just stop flowing? There's no amount of intellect that justifies like that respect the power on this planet, man. It's not for us to redirect. Being a child growing up around alcoholism and, and drug use and violence, it affects you. And there's the thing that we're very familiar with now, and it's called childhood trauma. And it's that feeling when things happen to you when you're very young and um, too young to process or express it. Sometimes that comes out later on in life. And unfortunately for me, that came out um, in my early teens when I discovered alcohol and drugs and, and started hanging out with people who were doing the same thing. So I'm Lindsay Knight. Um, I also go by the stage name Equal. I'm a hip hop artist and I'm from Muscaday First Nation. I'm Plains Cree, although I grew up in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan for most of my life. And I've traveled a lot, lot around Canada, but but I stay really close to my First Nations roots and my hip hop roots. I grew up in a family where there was alcohol in the home and a lot of alcohol in, in the family, in the extended families. My dad would have parties. My mom would always tell us to stay upstairs, stay upstairs. But of course, you know, my terror and my fear and my curiosity got the best in me. What I saw was my dad fighting with somebody and my mom screaming and people in the house yelling and everybody was getting so worked up about it and trying to stop the fight. And I remember starting to scream myself and then my mom would come running up the stairs. She came running up the stairs and she said, it's okay, it's okay, everything's okay, everything's okay. But she was crying. So seeing my mom cry and hearing all of this was terrifying because I didn't know who I could depend on, who was safe, where was my stability. And when I first started drinking and doing drugs, I realized, oh man, this is awesome. Because this lets me forget about everything that makes me feel bad. This helps me to forget about all of the pain that I have, all of the frustrations that I have about my family, about my parents, about being an Indian in the city where Racism is so rampant, and anyone who knows that 
that I'm an Indian or that my family are Indians, um, automatically we would be treated poorly in stores, anywhere we go. So all of that sort of shame that I had, it would just disappear with alcohol or with getting high. And so being young and being really good at sneaking around, <laughs> I was able to go out and I started partying and, and doing all kinds of things right from 13 on. It eventually got to a point where I was constantly needing to feel that, that alcohol spirit, as we call it. I was needing to be around it. I was needing to know that, that I would have it handy whenever I needed it. When I was a teenager, I, I thought it was cool to go out and do things like graffiti and, and um, hop trains and, and things that were really reckless. I think as young people, sometimes we feel invincible. We feel like we can't get hurt. And especially when you um, use alcohol or drugs, you feel almost superhuman. And there was one time that I went to a party on the west side here in Saskatoon. We had been to a club and I ended up at this house party. For some reason, I woke up earlier than everybody else. There were people laid out all over on the couches, on the floor, in various states of um, clothing, no clothing. It was like one of those movie scenes, the wild party. And I sat up and the first image that I saw was this young girl. And I saw this young girl who couldn't have been more than 13. And she was sitting on the floor, cross-legged, and she was crying and just rocking back and forth and crying so hard. And I just started crying with her because I saw myself in that little girl. And I went and sat in this AA meeting and I was the youngest one in there. There was a lot of, you know, 30, 40 year olds. I felt really out of place and I didn't go back. And, but what I did do was go back to drinking. I didn't care. I didn't care about her. I didn't care about my dad. I didn't care about anyone because I, I just wanted to escape. And I felt invincible. It was a summer night, I remember, here in Saskatoon. That night, I don't remember what I drank, but I knew it was a lot, and I knew that I was going to black out, and I just let myself black out. The next thing I remember was waking up in a hospital bed, and my sister was sitting there. She asked me if I remember what happened, and I said no. I felt my whole body just felt in so much pain. I felt so broken. And she said, I got a call from the police because you had been passed out in the middle of the road and you were almost hit by a car. So they took you to the hospital and they thought you had OD'd. And she said, Lindsay, if you keep this up, I do not want to have anything to do with you and I don't want my son to have anything to do with you. <laughs> and it was at that time, that was that time in my life that I knew that I had to quit for good. <laughs> and that was the very last time that I ever touched alcohol. I haven't touched a drop of alcohol, drugs, nothing. And it took a lot for me to do that. The first year was really hard because I didn't know how, I was scared about how I would have fun. What did fun mean without the escape? But the other thing that, that I realized in that year was that I had mental health issues that I had masked all of these years. I had anxiety, I had depression, and every time that I would start feeling a glimmer of that, that's where the alcohol and drugs would come in. I would use them to escape, use them to feel better. So I couldn't do that anymore. 
And I recognized and realized it, and I started going to a therapist. I went to a psychiatrist, went to a lot of ceremonies, talked to elders. And to this day, I'm still doing all of these things, and it's been almost 13 years because I have to ensure that I'm healthy. And that means an ongoing plan for your health. There's no such thing as just getting better. It takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of discipline. But first of all, you have to know that you're worth it. You have to love yourself enough. And then you have to know that you have supports. You have to reach out to those people who support you. And my mom was one of those. My sister is one of those. My husband is one of those. So I'm not afraid to reach out to them. I remember my dad decided that he wanted to quit drinking and he was tired of the lifestyle that he had. He was tired of hurting my mom and our family being an alcoholic. So he went to an elder because that's what we do a lot in our culture. I'm, I'm Nehiao Plains Cree and my dad is Cree. And, and although he wasn't really raised too much in the, the spiritual side of our culture, he was very much aware that um, to be indigenous here meant that we have this history of, of spirituality and ceremony and language and all of that. He went out to seek a better way for himself. My dad started going to ceremonies and he started bringing us to ceremonies. We were really engaged in, in learning about our culture and our teachings through ceremony. From that point on in my life, it was very much more positive. I also learned about residential schools and my dad went to day school, like a residential school where they get to come home at night. And my grandparents went to residential school. So I learned a lot about how these cycles of violence and addiction and um, parent, lack of parenting skills, they all come from that being lost throughout history in residential schools and through colonization. And it all made sense to me. And my heart broke because I, I see it's a lot of my family members still struggling in those cycles. And my dad was strong. He, he took it upon himself to stop those cycles for us. Believing that we choose to be addicted and violent. Believing that we choose to be inactive and silent. It was right up until my early 20s. I started getting into music at this time too. I had discovered hip hop. And I loved the way that people could tell stories over beats. I thought that was the most amazing way to tell a story. When I discovered hip hop and, and making music and just being able to um, think about my life experience as something that I could tell as a story on a beat, it's just something that really, um, I guess the word is emancipated me from that life or from that way of thinking about myself and my surroundings and my, my um, history and our Canadian history. And it gave me an opportunity to write all of that and to share all of that through um, lyrics and through performance. And when I started doing that, it's just like, and, and I was sober too. So it just seemed like all of my dreams started coming true. And I used to hear that a lot. It's like, if you quit doing drugs or quit drinking, all of your dreams will start coming true. You're gonna have this clarity. And I, and I didn't really believe it. And you know, sometimes when you're in that life, you don't really see outside of it. You think that, that nothing else can can happen or I'll never feel happy unless I'm immersed in this this horrible life you know but the thing is when I did when I was able to get myself out of that I did totally feel that that my dreams started coming true and everything that I had always wanted to do with music um, to travel all over the world to be able to record six albums to be able to be interviewed for huge, with huge opportunities. And all of this stuff just started happening because I was sober and because I was committed and totally dedicated to doing music. And that's what keeps me healthy. It's my music, my ceremonies, my language, and just knowing who I am. It's important for people to try like 
different routes of help, which she did try to do. Like she went to the AA meeting and like even if it wasn't for her, she obviously figured out something else that was. Mm -hmm. And I think that's like a huge thing because not everything that works for you is gonna work for me. The other thing with her was that she was able to find like a way to express herself through her music. And I think maybe sometimes the art forms can be a good escape for that. I'm Anishinaabe youth, so I'm Ojibwe. I think there's like that stigmatization where all native people are drunks or have addictions or are incarcerated. But we also have to realize that a lot of our people are still sick. Like the last residential school to close was in 1996. My mom was part of the 60s scoop. She experienced a lot of abuse in the household, right? And then it was expected that I was gonna fall into that. I've even been told, oh, you're just gonna be another statistic. But my mom made sure, no, no, my kids are not gonna be doing that. They're gonna go to school, they're gonna get to good jobs. These issues are what created the addiction, which is addiction here in the middle. Mm -hmm. Depression, whatever it is that person you may be struggling with. Personally, me, I don't, do drugs, I don't drink. I am very traditional because that's how my mom raised us, to be knowledge keepers um, and to be able to carry those teachings. You guys probably think, oh, um, we're not really uh, there. It's kind of like we're wiped out. Mm -hmm. But uh, a lot of people don't know, my community is thriving. We are thriving, we're doing really good. I think, especially in my school, which isn't really diverse, a lot of people are actually um, oblivious completely to what's going on. Mm -hmm. So I think this is just at least one step towards being aware. Our culture is so simple. It's like the most simplest thing. It's, it's literally like, just be kind to yourself and be kind to people in the mm -hmm. world. That's our culture. You don't have to be native to do that. Mm -hmm. It's hard for the brain to be in an environment of chaos and instability for a long time. It can be very painful, confusing, and demotivating. We often turn to unhealthy behaviors like drugs and alcohol to help us escape the hurt. And Lindsay's story shows us this. But as a teenager, you sometimes have little control over your environment, especially if the pain is being caused by your parents or other family members. So what are you to do? How do you help yourself develop mental health in these situations? Well, it's important to realize that what your brain is actually looking for when it chooses drugs or any other unhealthy behavior is to fulfill the three C's, connection, community, and compassion. Number one, connection. Your brain wants to feel connected to an activity that matters to you. Lindsay found music as her connection, but the options don't end there. Whether it's art, sports, reading, writing, dance, or school clubs, look for something that matters to you and do it. Number two, community. Your brain wants to feel like it belongs to a tribe. It can be a tribe of two or 200. The brain doesn't care, as long as you feel a part of a community that you can relate to. You know what it feels like to be around people that make you feel better, and the ones that drag you down. Find a tribe that helps you be the best version of you. And number three, compassion. Your brain wants to feel like it's being cared for. Compassion can come from friends, teachers, counselors, community leaders, or support centers. Also, your brain loves caring for others. Find someone or something you can express your compassion towards. Get involved with a job or volunteer work that supports other people in need, the environment, animal welfare, or anything else you care about. List as many ideas as you can to incorporate the three C's in your life. Your resiliency depends on it. With that in mind, until the next time, Let's do better by thinking better. Lindsay's struggles with substance abuse stem from her lack of connection, community, and compassion. Having grown up in a house with a lot of turmoil, she lacked the stability and support needed to develop a strong and confident sense of self. Sadly, this is especially common in Indigenous communities where 75% of residents feel alcohol use is a problem. The rate of depression and suicide in First Nations people is twice that of the national average. Lindsay was able to channel her destructive behavior and transform it into creativity through hip hop, which I found pretty cool. She reconnected with her indigenous community and strengthened her positive relationships. Her creative outlet allowed her to express and explore her feelings in a healthy way, while at the same time, creating something constructive that she used to help heal her community. 
Being treated with respect, regardless of background, is a human right. Embracing diversity is essential for any healthy, successful community.